from Washington, D.C., it's theCUBE, covering .next Conference. Brought to you by Nutanix. We're back, welcome to Nutanix.next, NextConf, hashtag NextConf. This is theCUBE, the leader in live tech coverage. We go out to the events, we extract the signal from the noise. My name is Dave Vellante and I'm joined by my co-host, Stuart Miniman. Mike Day is here, he's the CEO of PXP Solutions, a financial services company and a customer of Nutanix. Mike, thanks for coming on theCUBE. My pleasure. So, tell us a little bit more about PXP Solutions. Uh, we're a payment gateway, which is a, a part of the financial services industry that most people don't even think about. But if you think about going into a store, going into a hotel, presenting a card, we're the bit between there and the bank. So talk about a mission critical piece of, piece of uh, service. That is a very complicated process. It involves many banks, many card schemes, Visa, MasterCard, and so forth. So we actually have to be the piece between the retailer or, or the merchant, uh, the consumer, and the bank. So in thinking about your industry, and yep. some of the drivers and changes of the industry, how is that affecting your strategy with regard to information technology? Um, for us, it was about expanding our business. We, we came from that really old three-tier model, big investments, they're a lumpy IT. Uh, we're moving more and more to a, a global business. We uh, worked in the US, we have some big retailers here, we're involved in the EMV rollout for the US. And that creates demands on us where we have to have processing in the locality. So we had to create a new infrastructure here in the US. Uh, so we've taken up hosted space in New Jersey and we had to build a whole new processing infrastructure. Yeah. I don't want to have teams here, uh, nothing personal. I, I, you know, we're a small business, we don't want to have teams dotted around the world, which means I have to think about getting manageable IT uh, in the right territory. Okay, so, so, so Mike, well, I, I hear things like that and it comes to mind, well, why don't you just use the public cloud or you know, what is the edge uh, you know, implications of what you're doing? Edge computing has been, been talked about a lot. So uh, maybe you know, sketch out for us a little bit okay. about you know, kind of the, the scope of what you do and you know, do you tie into the public cloud? I think of like CDNs, are you, are you related to that? Or you okay, know, what, so what, this, what, this, what do you deal with and what yeah. don't you deal with? It's an interesting yeah. conversation. Yeah. It's one I've had with the, uh, the, the public cloud vendors. For us it's all about about PCI scope. You'll get all the merchants talking about this, it's about card data. You know, there's a lot in the press about companies being compromised. We provide secure processing, so as soon as that card is either on, the, on somebody's web page or it's delivered into a PED, we encrypt that data. Now, if we start putting that encrypted data and those tokens and card records, and we, we manage over a billion card records, into the public cloud, that brings that cloud infrastructure into scope of PCI. You don't want to be doing that. So we kind of have to use our own infrastructure, but we want to leverage, or leverage, that's a nice American way of saying it. We, we want to get some leverage to say that we want all the benefits of public cloud, but we need to do it ourselves. Now I'm sure a public cloud vendor will say, oh, we can be PCI compliant. Right this time, we don't want to do that. So we have a cloud solution, but it's our cloud. Okay, so you're, you're essentially trying to mimic that public cloud experience on-prem, yeah. Uh, and so presumably that's where Nutanix comes in. That's their whole message. Absolutely. So can you maybe take us through how you, where you came from and, and where you are now, how you got there? Okay, again, the benefits of being a small business, the benefits of being an ex-CIO means that we can make decisions quite quickly. You're not going through layers of you know, the CTO and his infrastructure guy and the SQL guy and so forth. You can play fast and loose. We had a three-tier architecture, largely coming to end of life. We had a big SAN. Uh, so you had lots of single points of failure actually in, in the process, and we needed to do something different. Um, we'd been bumping into Nutanix, uh, and they were very aggressive three years ago, as you can imagine, as a new entrant. They did the puppy dog sale, you know, here, have one, <laughs> see how you get on. We, uh, we deployed that, we were going to do a VDI deployment, which seems to be how most people start, but actually we thought, why? why, why do you do that? So we went straight to heavy lifting, and we put production into, our production environment into Nutanix. Uh, and immediately kitted out the two new data centers with Nutanix kit. Um, it means that a whole storage compute piece has gone from our, our daily management. Okay, and, and Mike, can you talk about the operational model? You said especially, so you've got some remote sites that you don't even want anybody there. Yep. How many people do you have managing this? How's that different from you know, the old sand days that you had before? Um, 
I hesitate. Um, six people operate our entire infrastructure. They're not located anywhere near the infrastructure. The infrastructure is in uh, the London Docklands and in New Jersey. Yeah. Uh, we go to New Jersey for physical inspections once a year. Yeah. Everything else is done remotely. Yeah, I, I'm from New Jersey originally. I understand why people don't want to go there too often, but. Uh... <laughs> it's a nice place to visit. Uh, but, but, but right, so it, it, does it live up to that you know, invisible infrastructure that, that Nutanix, what do your people and operators, what do they touch, what don't they have to worry about? Okay, so if I give you a scenario where we obviously have processing in more than one data center, one of the things that we need to be able to do with that, that processing is to move stuff, either for reasons of uh, operational requirements where you're, you're trying to take a part of your infrastructure down for maintenance, or if you had a, a disaster recovery incident, you need to be able to move your processing to these different DCs. What we can do and what we do on a regular basis is actually we will ship our, our processing between the different stacks in the different locations and that's a press of a button. I mean obviously our infrastructure and our systems and solutions are designed to operate in that way but literally we can, we can move processing to a new data center and in terms of uh, consumer experience, no change. Technically there's about a, a half a second uh, delay but in half a second, no problem at all. So we can move stuff between data centers and we do that on a regular basis. Mike, you mentioned that initially you were considering just doing a VDI workload, yeah. kind of testing the waters, and you decided, no, let's just go for it. What were your concerns at that point? Um, I think the concerns for us was, does it live up to the hype? You know, we were being given lots of figures, lots of, like all the vendors were doing, they were telling us how much quicker it would be, how much less compute we would need, how cheap it would be. Um, but only when you do this thing in, in real life, when you actually do some real heavy lifting, when you start installing SQL servers into a Nutanix environment, does it work? I had a queue of people telling me, don't do it, it's going to be a disaster. Um, and we, we did it, and it, it wasn't a disaster. It, it was so outstanding. We always talk about the labor cost. As a former CIO, you know how labor intensive IT is. Yeah. And our premise is, you know, when we describe mimicking cloud on-prem, yeah. our premise has always been, and our research indicates that a lot of the savings are in the productivity of the IT people. You can shift yeah. those resources elsewhere. Guys like you are trying to do digital transformations, which sounds like such a buzzword, but it's actually starting to, to gain foothold, it's a real Absolutely. deal. And you can't be doing LUN provisioning and fund that and fund these analytics and data-driven transformations. Yep. So, is that a correct premise? Did it have a sort of major business impact on your IT staff? It does, I mean, basically what it means now is our guys can get on and do the fun stuff. Uh -huh. You know, when we started doing this, they all thought they were losing jobs and you know, we were going to be cutting headcount. We were never doing that because we never got out of the, out of the soup. You know, the IT guys won't understand this. You spend all day fighting fires. You never get to do the fun stuff. What we've managed to do is we've managed to get to the point that our fundamental processing is just solid. We can deploy servers at the click of a button. We can move servers between data centers at the click of a button. We can, we can do the stuff that everybody aspires to but then no, those guys can then go and do the fun stuff. What's we, the fun stuff? The fun stuff for us is the analytics. It's, you know, it's using tools like Splunk to truly understand what's going on, getting predictive in what we do. That's the fun stuff. Were the, were the skill sets of the guys who were putting out fires with the infrastructure compatible with the fun stuff, or did you have to reskill? We, we trained. Um, it's, very, it's very easy to take a bunch of guys that you've always asked to do one job, then change the job and then assume the guys are bad guys. That, that, that's not how it works. Yeah. You know, I, I do think it's 80% personality, 20% skill. You can fill it in. So what we did was the guys who had been previously just firefighting, it took a while, and it took a while for them to trust us that we weren't really t taking them into a trap of some sort, but we reskilled them. We didn't just bring new people in. Would you had, you feel like you would have had to hire more people if you didn't? Yeah, we, Make I'd, this move? I'd say we couldn't have actually deployed in the model we currently did deploy to uh, with the people we have. Uh, we were looking at uh, op looking for operational efficiency, and but we want resilience. You know, think about payments. You don't get two chances to take a payment. I mean, at a very high level, it does not be precise, but I mean, in percentage terms, I mean, how much more? What, what percent more IT labor would you have needed if you didn't make this move? Is it? 
was it a 10% factor, 20%, 50%, double? Uh, uh, remember, we're a small company. We're talking about six people now. We'd probably need another four or five people. And at oh. one point, we had that as vacancies. Wow. Uh, um, we've done other things recently. So in terms of our corporate environment, we've gone out to Office 365. You know, we're taking away, again, stuff that doesn't add value to us as a business and pushing that out of, the, out of what we do. That's a substantial business it, impact. It is, so, so Mike, you seem really happy with Nutanix, but what's on your wish list? You know, what would you like to see from Nutanix or maybe their ecosystem? We've got the, the big expo floor here. You know, what, what would make your company's life easier, you know, simpler? I think for us it's just having some clarity as to where they're heading next. You know, they're, 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 they've been an excellent startup. They've, they've been moving the market, they've been ahead of the market. The problem I've always seen is companies as they get to this size, almost like the, the wave of the market swamps back over them. You know, they start hiring in from all the companies they used to be different to. Yeah. And it's how do they stop that happening? How do they preserve the essence of what made them um, dynamic? Uh, so you, you can talk about the functionality, you can talk about the, the hypervisor, we're, we're a, a an ESX house, we use VMware, but we're now using Acropolis hypervisor in some of our environments. Okay. The issue for it, that it, is... It, it, any, any information you can give us is how you make that decision, whether you go ESX or AHV? It's purely down to the, not so much the capabilities of, of, of AHV or ESX. We think AHV from a price point perspective is, is incredibly attractive. But as you know, everybody's infrastructure isn't just the hypervisor, it isn't just the, the hardware. It's all of the other ancillary platforms, you know, the security platforms, the, the thin platforms and so forth. And until those vendors start saying they support AHV, that's a barrier to us for using it in a production environment. Nutanix are great, they'll say they'll look after us, but no CIO ever got, got praise for just trusting a guy they met on the street, you know? It's, You've got to be careful. So you want that ecosystem to develop further. Very much so. Whether it's, whether it's Nutanix, you know, writing, integrating with a particular platform that you need or vice versa. Yes, definitely. And you can see that here. There are some announcements I know that are coming to that from some of the vendors here where they have much tighter integration to AHV. That, that's got to pick up a pace. Well, and that's their philosophy, I would presume, as, you know, we're going to write to our API, at least make that open. Yeah. No, but somebody's got to write to the API, so there's Absolutely. work has to be done. Yeah. But fundamentally it's there, it's not a closed, you know, closed stack, yeah. as it were. But it's got to be a, there's got to be a compelling client driver for that. So I can understand where these other vendors aren't making, haven't made the investment in the past, because until they know they can make money with a, having a deployment with AHV, why would you invest in that? But I think Nutanix have got to the point now where there's no doubt they're a player. So well, now being you a have public to be company involved. helps, you're right? Yeah. And to sure. see the growth rates, and it's just, you know, helps with that sort of advertising the brand, but yeah. that takes time, and they're still a small company. Very much so. Yeah. yeah. Mike, you said you started out with VDI and kind of got to know it. If you kind of look back at what you've done, are there any surprises or anything you'd give advice to people that, that are just starting the, the, this journey that, from your learnings? Um, I'll use a really bad analogy that I used last year and most people don't sort of like it as much as I do. Um, it, when people start on VDI, and we never did it, we actually have never gone down the VDI route. We looked at it and went, nah, we've got more important stuff, more fun stuff to do. Going down this road, taking a VDI approach, it's, I said it's like driving your Ferrari down the high street. You might think you look cool, but you're not really driving a Ferrari. You know, you've got to take this, this kid out on the road and you need to give it some heavy load. Because in the early days, the new tax box hated being, being quiet. That they took time to spool up and so forth. That problem's gone away now. But you know, if you're going to really look at this stuff and you're going to get proper um, return on your investment, give it heavy lifting to do and, and use it in anger and don't just take the, the easy option. You know, the option where you don't have to convince the production guys. Yeah, so I would say that's, for us, the biggest, the biggest yeah, lesson. Absolutely, find, find one of those hard problems, throw something meaningful at it. Uh, yeah, and, and, and you learn then, you, learn you know. Then. Absolutely. How about any thoughts on the event? I mean, it's early, but, you yeah, know, you, interactions. You've been before too, it sounds like. This is my third, uh, my third done next, so they've only had three, so. Okay, so you've been all three in the US. You didn't go to the one in Vienna. Uh, I did as well. well uh, my uh, head office was in Vienna, so I actually wasn't at the event, but I, I attended the parties. <laughs> uh, okay, even better. What do you get out of events like this? Um, two things. First of all, we get to understand what's going on. Uh, we do get briefings from Nutanix, obviously we're quite involved with them, but it's good to hear it and hear the reaction from, uh, from other customers. 
I think more importantly is an opportunity to network with other customers in Nutanix, understand their issues, share ideas. Um, it's a great networking event for like-minded people. Great. Uh, and I think for me, it's worth the trip over to the US to do that. Excellent. Good, Mike, thanks very much for coming to theCUBE. It was a pleasure, pleasure having you. Appreciate your insights. Cheers. All right, keep, keep right there everybody. Stu and I will be back at Nutanix.next, next conf. This is theCUBE, we'll be right back.